Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Nicole Yukam. I am the Foundation Manager for Animal Farm Foundation, and joining me later in this presentation is Caitlin Quinn, who is the Director of Operations at HeartSpeak. Today, we're going to be talking about how we market our dogs as individuals. Um, and the first question we often in Animal Farm get asked um, when people learn that we work a lot with pit bull dogs because we work to end discrimination is, oh, well, can you tell me how we market our pit bull dogs so that they go home faster? What's the best way that we can market all of our pit bull dogs? So my answer to that is, First, the question of, so what is a pit bull to you? Because a pit bull to me and a pit bull to the person sitting next to me and the person sitting next to you is going to be very different. It's a very subjective term and it means a lot of different things to different people. So let's start by asking ourselves, do we know what a pit bull dog is? And moreover, do we really know what any of the dogs in our shelters are? So we're going to start out by doing a quick little fun guessing game. And what I'm going to ask you to do is take a look at these pictures. In your head, I want you to think of what you would label these dogs if they came into your shelter. Uh, Peter here was labeled a pit bull when he came to us. He got adopted out and his adopters got a DNA test done on Peter. Um, and he was actually a boxer beagle lab. That's what came back in his DNA. Um, but he was, again, he was labeled a pit bull when he came into Animal Farm from another shelter. Now we'll move on to Jameson here. I just want to move through these semi quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Um, but Jameson, take a look at him. Think about what you would label him if he came into your shelter. He is very short. It's, I don't know, it's hard to see in the pictures, but his legs are kind of stubby. This is his full grown size. Um, now, let me introduce you to Jameson's parents. His dad was a Beagle Maltese, um, and his mom on the right there was a purebred Amstaff. Uh, he had seven, or excuse me, he had six other siblings. Not one of them did they look anything alike. There was ones that were like black and white spotted. They all looked very different. Um, all came from the same pen. And I'm going to guess that none of you guys got all of those breeds that were found in Jameson's DNA correctly. And what I tend to find, so. I have started to follow and bark on Instagram. Um, and if you guys are interested in this at all, I would highly recommend checking them out. They oftentimes will share this sort of content, which is a picture of a family dog and, a, and then what the dog's DNA came back as. Um, and what I see more often than not is this sort of Heinz 57 large mixture of dogs and maybe you can pick out one or two of those breeds that are showing up on the DNA in the dog's physical appearance. It's also going to be subjective from person to person. Um, I've, I showed this picture to one of my colleagues and I said, well, I would have, I would have labeled that a Rottweiler mix in a shelter and she said, well, I don't know, I would have maybe given it something else. So it's a very subjective, especially when we're looking at dogs with this large amount of breeds in their DNA. So when we look at a dog, we're actually only seeing 50 of its 20,000 genes. So there's 20,000 genes that make up a dog's entire genome, and only 50 are what you see on the outside, the dog's physical appearance. And we don't know where those 50 genes are coming from. They don't, they're not going to necessarily come from that top uh, percentage there. So just because a dog is mostly Labrador Retriever, it doesn't mean the dog's going to look like a Labrador Retriever. 
it could look like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We don't know where those genes, those 50 genes are going to be pulled from um, to make up that dog's physical appearance. Uh, now, hashtag is another one. Hashtag does sports with his um, adopter, one of our um, employees at Animal Farm. So take a look at hashtag and what do you think that he is? So I think we're all going to be surprised to see that hashtag is predominantly a Labrador Retriever, but that's not what is coming up in his physical appearance. Um, because again, it's just a very fragment, just a small fragment of what we're seeing in the dog's physical appearance. And so these two are the last two we're going to do. Um, so take a quick look at them. Try to figure out what you think you would label them in your shelter if they came into your shelter. And here are the DNA results. So technically, the dog on the left uh, is primarily a boxer pit bull mix. I think people would look at you sideways um, if you told them that because so often assume that what you see on the outside is what makes up a dog's DNA or the majority of the dog's DNA. But that's just not how physical appearances present themselves in dogs. So. Uh, and Sunny on the left here is predominantly a pit bull terrier. I don't think any of you would have labeled him a pit bull terrier, American pit bull terrier, if he came into your shelter. Um, so, do we have a lot of pit bull dogs in our shelter? Maybe, but I think it's more honest to say that we have a lot of mongrels, dogs that have no definable type or breed and dogs that have personalities that are across the board and those personalities have nothing to do with the way the dogs look or that arbitrary label that we are placing on the dog. Now I'm going to guess that a lot of you disagreed with each other. I know we're not all in the same room so it's a little bit har harder to do the exercise um, but I'm going to guess that some of you had difference of opinions because every time I do this, everybody has a different opinion on what breed we're seeing in each of these dogs. Um, and what I did to showcase that a little bit better about how much in, in disagreement we are, as well as wrong most of the time, um, is I went on to Petfinder. I looked for dogs in the Indianapolis area. And I took a look and I, what I did was I found dogs. These two dogs were actually right next to each other on Petfinder. Um, they look so similar, right? But they have two very different labels because the labels are so subjective between person to person, um, and they're just wrong. So I'll go through a couple really quick just to show you. Um, again, here is three very similar dogs with three very different labels, and those labels aren't telling us anything about they're not marketing the dogs for us. So King Boo, um, is it more important to guess at a label that's American Staffordshire Terrier and have people place their own personal biases, whether good or bad? It could be either. It really depends on how, what my upbringing was and what my experiences with dogs were in my family and what I've been told to believe about dogs are going to form biases within myself that I'm going to then project onto those labels. So we're doing our dogs a dis disservice by putting those labels on a dog. If I see that Angie is a plot hound and I've had a previous experience or my friends have had plot hounds and they've acted a certain way, I'm going to assume that some of those behaviors are going to present themselves in these dogs and the reality is we have no idea if that dog's a plot hound or not um so maybe this dog is a good match for me maybe it isn't but i'm already going to have some preconceived notions about who that dog is as an adopter because as animal welfare experts 
the shelter is telling me that that dog is a possum. So do you see how there's some consequences to those arbitrary labels that can affect how we market our dogs? And again, here's a few more. And remember that only 0.25% of a dog's DNA is what we see on the outside. And the last one here, Punky and Sparkle. These two dogs, if I just looked quickly, I would think they were the same dog, just taken at a, a different angle. Um, and th so it's just so subjective. And as humans, sometimes one person will see the color purple when another person will see the same thing and they'll call it blue. And while we're looking at the same thing, we're both looking at the same dog. It's only our perceptions that differ. Us labeling things is just our own perception and projections. It's not actual facts. We cannot look at a dog and know its origin. So we need to start marketing our dogs as individuals and stop putting labels on them, which are going to become barriers to our adoption and marketing process. Now you want to talk about how language is affects how we market our dogs. Uh, we hear from shelters a lot that we have a lot of pit bull dogs in our shelter or nobody wants to adopt out our pit bull dogs. So how do, we, how do we market them better? When we say things like this, when we put negative things out there, whether we actually verbalize them or not, they're going to come back to us. They're going to become these self-fulfilling prophecies when we define a situation as real, the situation becomes real. Those problems become real in their consequences. So when we're making statements like these, whether it's to our fellow colleagues, to our friends, to our family, to volunteers, we are perpetuating those myths and the consequences are the problems that we thought we had. We're creating those problems by perpetuating these myths to our community. And there's lots of real world examples of this that I can give you just to illustrate one example of what can go wrong when we adopt these beliefs that are not based on facts. Um, we can remember this Salem witch trials. There was uh, one doctor that declared that this unidentified illness that was happening in a community was caused by witches. And while we all know that this is a false statement, it caused hysteria in the entire community, neighbors accusing neighbors of witchcraft, and the, and the consequences were real. In this case, there was tragic executions of innocent people. So just because something isn't real, if we perceive it to be real, then it becomes real within its consequences. Once we stop targeting arbitrary labels and we stop talking about our dogs as labels and we start talking about them as individuals, we no longer have those problems that we thought we once had. And we're seeing it in shelters all across the country. We have a shelter map of, on our website of all of the shelters across the country that no longer label any of their dogs in the shelter unless they come in with uh, DNA or some sort of paperwork. And you can call any one of them and they'll tell you that since they stopped caring about the labels and instead promoted the personalities of the dogs and promoted good matches, the community then followed suit. This is a quote from Lenaway Humane Society who removed labels. They actually transfer dogs in that are labeled pit bull in other shelters because they don't care about what a dog looks like. They don't care about what the dog is labeled. They care about who the dog's personality is. So they ask shelters like, hey, send us dogs that are good with other dogs because those are the dogs that are going home. Those are the dogs that are easy to send home here in our community. So they'll send them dogs and they don't care what they look like. 